This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco with the Neurology Podcast, and today we're on the second of a four-part series on autoimmune encephalitis. Our last episode was hosted by Joseph Dalmau, where we reviewed updates on NMDA receptor encephalitis, along with some things on the horizon for the field of autoimmune neurology. Today, we are joined by Sarosh Irani, professor of autoimmune neurology at Oxford University, and soon to join the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Sarosh last joined us on the podcast on June 23rd, 2022, where we reviewed LGI-1 antibody encephalitis, where we discussed some retrospective data on corticosteroids versus IVIG. We are also joined by John Soltes, who's in a two-year fellowship at Oxford University and will also be joining the Mayo Clinic team in Jacksonville after training. They're going to walk us through a practical approach to testing for autoantibodies and autoimmune encephalitis. I think it can feel like a black box when we send those panels off. So our goal today is kind of to demystify that process. So Roche, John, welcome to the program. Thank you. Look forward to joining in. Thank you for having us. Sarosh, talk to us about terms of this intracellular antigen testing, usually associated with our high-risk perineoplastic disorders, and how that contrasts from maybe the autoimmune encephalitis panels when we're talking a little bit more about cell surfaces, synaptic antigens. For me, really, it all boils down to a clinical pretest probability. One would always think that a good clinical assessment comes first, avoiding the possibility of false positives in laboratory testing, which we know is a problem. But Given that, often we think about intracellular antigens as being associated with the high risk of cancers and having a relatively lower risk of being treatment responsive, whereas the opposite is true for cell surface antigens, where cancer is relatively uncommon and a treatment response is almost universal. So when you're thinking about the two, usually there's a set of approaches which could encompass both or either. So if you think of both, people would often say, well, let's do immunohistochemistry. So let's take patient's serum, patient's CSF. Again, emphasizing these should be patients with a, with a good pretest probability of having an antibody and apply them to brain sections. That's often in many labs considered a screening diagnostic test, immunohistochemistry often referred to or immunofluorescence. And the idea is do IgGs from the patient's serum or CSF bind that tissue And if so, do they look like a pattern you recognize? Do they look like an intracellular pattern or do they look like a more cell surface pattern? Knowing that initial positivity and which pattern we look for will then send you down the route of specific testing for certain antigens, which we can often recognize on that immunohistochemical pattern itself. But you would go down and confirm that antigen. For So for intracellular antigens, often people would do Western blot, sometimes ELISAs. And then for cell surface antigens, often people would run cell-based assays. So it's that kind of algorithm, starting with immunohistochemistry and then going down two alternative paths which speak to very different clinical presentations and very different clinical meanings. Yeah, so we have that tiered approach for these, but definitely some overlap. And then you mentioned that importance of sending off samples from the CSF and serum. Can you talk to us about why that's so important, John? For the many different antigens that are tested on these panels, some of them are found more frequently or more readily in one of those compartments compared to the other. So for example, the LGI, if you're going after LGI antigen, you'll probably find it more often in the serum than the CSF, whereas the reverse is true for the NMDA receptor. That said, there's often significant overlap uh, between the two, but getting to the point that Sarash made earlier that you can run into false negatives and really thinking about pretest probability, sending both can really help you sort out, is this a meaningful result that you get when you do get a positive autoantibody? And is there ever a time when you're just starting the evaluation in serum versus sending both at the same time? I think there are occasions where that's necessary. Sometimes less severe clinical presentations where a spinal fluid examination may not be justifiable. For example, patients who present with seizures alone sometimes and perhaps sometimes infrequent seizures. Also in people who are behaviorally challenged And then, of course, that includes a group of these patients with autoimmune encephalitis, particularly the patients with um, NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis, who can be some of the most 
difficult to manage behavior with on a ward. And then a small cohort of patients who are, for example, anticoagulated, where a spinal fluid examination may be relatively contraindicated. And then, as John said, serum can be a valuable screen in those patients. But the problem is really that for each autoantigen, there's often a slightly different relative likelihood of detection in CSF versus serum. And so overall, I think the message should be wherever possible, begin the evaluation with both samples. No, I think those practical points, right, when you're up against challenging clinical scenarios, right, how do you approach those cases? And understanding that CSF is usually going to be the most sensitive space in order to detect these. You've mentioned this, maybe some certain patient populations that we should think through. For example, that like new onset refractory status epilepticus. How do you guys approach testing in that population? I think that's a particularly interesting population where Studies have suggested that the rates of autoantibodies can be high in some populations. I don't think clinical experience speaks to that necessarily. Nevertheless, there are groups of patients who have GABA B receptor antibodies, perhaps in particular, some with LGI-1 antibodies who will present with status epilepticus. And in those patients, certainly a broad screen is often warranted, really often regardless of the detailed clinical presentation of that patient, because I think for that condition in particular, there's a notoriously poor prognosis and being able to assign a specific set of treatments to that patient and continue down an escalation of immunotherapy pathway can often be very helpful and an autoantibody can really help you do that. Whereas otherwise, I think with that patient population, it can be hard to know when to stop immunotherapy or when to go on and continue the treatment paradigm. So for me, that's a population where I think I would have a very low threshold of screening for them. And of course, their pretest probability is pretty good in terms of having an autoimmune cause, but it's perhaps not as good as was first mooted. Are there other populations or subgroups that we think have a unique kind of testing approach? There are some other interesting clinical presentations that can be associated with autoimmune encephalitis but are not necessarily all-inclusive. I mean, there are certainly other common causes for those symptoms, particularly like a first episode of psychosis. In general, if you have evidence that there might be something more to the syndrome, for example, if you have evidence of inflammation either from the spinal tap or an MRI, or if you have something in the history and keep going back to the importance of a good history that might, for example, be suggestive of, of a seizure or some type of preceding neurologic symptom, your pretest probability for testing starts to increase and it's worth considering sending the panels in those situations. Another possibility that many people consider is acquiring a sample or taking some extra sample to save for later. So when history is clarified or you have more information, you can go back to that initial sample and send the test if you're otherwise on the brink. Sarash, would you like to talk about another potential clinical condition with pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection? Sure, yeah. So the condition John's referring to PANDAS, or sometimes more contemporarily known as PANS, is a condition with a long history of various autoantibodies being detected in that in that patient population. And I think a lot of that work is work which needs to be extended and continued. And some of those patients certainly have forms of autoimmune encephalitis. And I would like to think of them as pediatric autoimmune encephalitis rather than giving them an alternative diagnostic category. And it will be a small subset of the PANDAS patients. And those patients in a childhood setting We think of NMDA receptor antibodies commonly. We think of GABA-A receptor antibodies in some of those patients. There are some papers on dopamine receptor antibodies. And then there's a large group of patients who have a clinical phenotype of autoimmune encephalitis who are seronegative. And I think there's a lot of important work to be done to really plug that gap in the the field at the moment. Now, there's so much work to be done, but I think some of these points are really important keeping that idea of the clinical phenotype, that pretest probability. John, I love your point about saving samples, right? If we're going in there and getting spinal fluid, right, try to save that extra tube because it does feel like there's other things that come up as you go along in testing. While we wait for these labs to return, right, which can take a little while, are there other things that we can utilize that can be useful in some populations, Suresh? 
For sure. It's a very good point because I think there's a slight belief that one should wait for the results before thinking about treatments. But this comes back to the point John and I have both made and that you've emphasised there, which is a clinical point, really. We should be going on the clinical syndromes and more and more and more. I'm pleased to say we're able to recognise patients clinically and then treat them before the antibody results come back. Which tests can we rely on in that sort of situation? As ever with medicine, the, the simple answer is rely on none. The combination, the triad of an MRI, a CSF and an EEG can be very helpful, particularly, I think, if an MRI shows changes which are classical of an encephalitis, which can certainly occur in patients who are phenotypically mild, so it can help sometimes. And by that, I mean particularly T2 hyperintensities of the medial temporal lobes. Um, although, of course, there are other patterns. And a CSF with more than five lymphocytes, again, can often be helpful in giving you enough ammunition to say, okay, I'm going to treat this patient empirically while awaiting antibody results to come back. And of course, that goes as part and parcel of trying to continuously assess the patient and continuously reevaluate the patient for differential diagnoses as well as for the diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis because a lot of this can come from reasonable exclusion of other causes and then you're left in this slightly difficult category still of seronegative encephalitis so i think i think certainly we should be thinking clinically with that triad of other tests and then occasionally we've also found that in some patients in particular HLA testing can be useful because patients with certainly with LGI1, with IGLON5 antibodies and with CASPA2 antibodies can have very tight HLA associations, sometimes in up to 95% of that patient population. So if they don't have the HLA of interest, that can often give you a useful negative predictive tool. But not over relying on antibody result, right? And trying to keep that in clinical context is really important and helpful. John, how do folks approach patients or testing in resource-limited settings or in settings where you know, they have restrictions within their practice or hospital? In any setting, whether it's resource-limiting or not, it's important to remember that an autoantibody test in isolation is never diagnostic. And you always need to go back to that clinical picture and think about what syndrome it is you're, you're evaluating for and testing for. In some instances, if you are in a resource-limited practice, some clinical features might sway you one way or the other. So for example, faciobrachial dystonic seizures are almost pathognomonic for LGI-1 encephalitis. And perhaps ordering the antibody is, while it has a high pretest probability, is ultimately less helpful for you with your overall clinical management. But obviously, for, for some of the other antigen, that's not possible. Going back to thinking about your clinical evaluation picture, it's important to also um, think about Sarash's point that seronegative encephalitis is nevertheless a clinically meaningful and useful diagnosis to, to have on your differential or to specifically make uh, for the patient, and that can inform your clinical practice. More and more, there's more trials coming out on how best to manage some of these patients and looking at response to different immunotherapies or different evaluation paradigms, et cetera. So there's other things that you can fall back on in the absence of knowing the specific antibody. If you do treat them through their acute episode and want to refer them out later on down the road or have them follow up with a specialist, it can be really helpful um, to, again, think about pulling some extra serum or some extra cerebral spinal fluid aside for uh, later testing, um, perhaps in a research setting, or um, you know, via, via some other methodology um, to, to help inform a, a provider later on down the road. Suresh, any other helpful points in that challenging population or world? I think the other thing I would like to emphasize is that within poorer countries, certainly we are looking to try and find ways to offer good value testing, which could be high throughput. So I think these kinds of approaches are underway. We should look forward to them. And I think there are certainly ways to do this, which may or may not benefit from panels. And it may be that in some cases, for example, more focused testing is required. So 
it's not implausible that a clinician who's seeing these patients, a general neurologist who is seeing these patients, will have a very good idea of exactly which autoantibody they're aiming to look for here. I think patients with NMDA receptor antibodies, LGI-1 antibodies, can be highly characteristic. Some of the MOG encephalitis patients, highly characteristic. So it may be sufficient just to test one sometimes. And that kind of approach could be rolled out in countries which are less resource rich. We definitely have some unmet needs and need to think about it and how we roll this out on a, on a more global scale. So I appreciate those points. Are there other antibodies in your practice that we find that we're overlooking when we're setting that panel? You mentioned one just during our conversation of GABA A encephalitis. I think one that we don't always think about, Sarosh. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I think it's also important to say at this point that overlooking them is not unreasonable sometimes. This this area is fast-paced. Even for people that are fully immersed in the area, it can be hard to keep up. There are publications coming out all the time. There are rare antibodies. There are commoner antibodies. And I think my message overall in terms of which antibodies we overlook as a group of neurologists is to say, lean on your experts, because I think it is a very difficult area to keep up with. I think there are probably three main types of antibody, I would say, that can be overlooked. So I think we're learning about one still, very much so, which is the IGLON-5 antibody, this really exciting interface between autoimmunity and neurodegeneration, where patients can present with a usually very slow onset syndrome. And so something that we don't often consider in the autoimmune realm, but that's certainly something which when looked for is found more commonly than one might think. I think the other one is LGI-1 antibodies still. And I think that because they are often elderly and the seizures are often subtle. Myoclonic jerks are often mistaken for facial brachial dystonic seizures. Patients can just have small thermal sensations or shudders through their body, which can very easily be dismissed. And their insidious cognitive presentation, which it can often be, can be mistaken for a, a medial temporal lobe pathology, an Alzheimer's type pathology. So I think those are the two antibodies that can be overlooked sometimes. And then the other thing that is very important to mention is the overinterpretation of antibodies. And I mean that in the sense of particularly low titers of some antibodies, GAD antibodies, TPO antibodies, and with a number of colleagues from around the world, there's been a very nice recent study in JAMA Neurology looking at exactly this problem. And actually, overdiagnosis leads to overtreatment, leads to complications for patients. And again, leaning on your local expert just to get a little bit of guidance in which testing modality is the right one to think about in specific populations can often be very helpful. So those are probably my three areas, but I don't blame people for this at all. I think it's a very difficult area to keep up with, even as someone whose job is to keep up with that area. It is just a constant evolution and thought process. And I agree that friendly autoimmune neurologist is always right around the corner. Are there other practical points that practitioners should be aware of that could help them in clinical practice? A couple of other points to consider. One is really knowing what you're ordering when you order an antibody panel, because not all panels are created equally and not all panels are comprehensive. It's something that's really challenging, especially if you're in a busier practice to think about, but always just keep on the back of your mind that a limitation in interpretation might be due to, to how comprehensive the test is and consider if you need to order a different test. That's another area where leaning on your local expert can really help out. It's a quick conversation um, with them and it, it could be potentially very meaningful for you. Another thing to think about is, is that some of these antibodies are highly associated with an underlying malignancy. And if there's any red flags that you encounter clinically, um, for example, if it's progressing much more rapidly than you would expect, or if it's a, a cell surface antibody and you are hoping for a better response to an immunotherapy, while you're awaiting for the test results, it's worth looking into if you've done due justice and looking for an underlying malignancy, for example, doing a pan-CT, or if it's a more targeted malignancy, for example, like an ovarian teratoma in a young female with an MDA receptor encephalitis, 
considering that higher resolution image to look for the underlying tumor is something that can be really important and uh, can, can really change management just while you're awaiting for the antibody results. I like that point about the malignancy piece. And we talked about over relying on antibody results, but one area where you can really depend on the antibody is to help for the search and malignancy. You can let that guide that, depending again on some of the examples you just shared, that's really helpful. Sorosh, any other practical tips to share? Really difficult thing in clinical practice is just keep centered on the clinical features here because I think there's a very good chance that most neurologists will remain other possibilities if they're not thinking too hard about the diagnostic panel. I know today is about the diagnostics and the laboratory testing, but just to re-emphasize that concept of keeping firmly grounded in the clinical features of the patients, their tempo of evolution, the alternative diagnoses, and always keeping as broad a mind as possible. I always go back to that. I really like that cognitive heuristics paper in Annals of Neurology published a few years ago, showing that neurologist thinking is the key element in diagnostics. I think well said. I think a perfect way to kind of wrap things up, John and Sorsh, I can't thank you guys enough for your time and trying to unlock this black box of antibody testing. For our audience, this series will continue with a conversation with Owen Flanagan and Grace Gombele on expanding the differential in autoimmune encephalitis. So please join us for our next episode. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.